our next speaker is Priya Banerjee from the Department of Physics at the University uh, at Buffalo in the US. Thank you so much. I would like to thank the organizers for bringing us together virtually this year in uh, this year's uh, Next Generation Biophysics Symposium. Uh, there are fantastic talks in the morning and the afternoon session, and Irvan also uh, started beautifully this particular session of biophysical phase separation. So I will continue this thread and talk to you about our recent efforts in understanding the structure and dynamics of protein RNA condensates, and I'll focus on some biophysical model system that we have been using to study um, the phase separation in, in, in vivo. As Evan mentioned in his talk, uh, by now we know that uh, cells have different membranous organelles which uh, form via liquid-liquid or liquid-solid phase transition. Uh, initial efforts were utilized to under understand phase behavior in eukaryotic systems. Now we know that bacterial uh, cells also utilize uh, similar processes to uh, compartmentalize um, biochemical reaction in space and uh, time. Stephanie Weber will talk about that. Um, what I would like to do here today is sort of to understand in you know, all these uh, different biomolecular condensates, um, I would ask two questions um, and that would constitute two parts of my talk. My first question would be to understand the structure of these condensates and, and what we'd like to understand is basically what are the liquid-like uh, structure of these, are these isotropic even in the simplest cases where you don't have multiphasic structures? And, and, and the second part of the talk would focus on understanding the liquid-like properties of these condensates. Now, the inspiration to understand the spatial organization of these condensates come from um, the structure that we observe in, in, in cells. Uh, as Evan mentioned that uh, there are biomolecular condensates such as nucleus and stress granules with these multi-layered, multi-phasic structures. And I'm not gonna talk to you about it, although we have done some work on this field. What I'm gonna talk to you about is something a little bit more intriguing. Uh, so if you have these RNPs in, in cells, if you overexpress an RNP such as TDP43, you see this uh, back-related condensate where you have a low density phase embedded within a high density phase, right? Similar hollow structures or back-related condensates were also observed for, for nuclear germ granules um, from Ruth Lemus lab. So today I'm gonna focus on understanding the formation of such structures, um, which we just started beginning to understand. So to tell you a little bit about protein-protein or protein RNA interaction, I need to zoom in inside these condensates and you'll see this is really a soft biomolecular uh, state, right? Uh, where you have uh, you know, condensed protein and RNA chains and there are protein-protein or protein RNA interactions going on that keeps uh, this uh, condensate stabilized against the cost of uh, you know, mixing entropy. One of the important uh, questions that we are interested in understanding how overlapping chain, react, uh, chain uh, uh, interactions uh, regulate the properties of these condensates. And why we're interested in this? Because as you know, in biomolecular condensates, there are hardly one component. There are more than one component, uh, basically. So even if you have two components, one is, uh, say, your protein, which is component A, which can undergo phase transition uh, via protein-protein uh, interaction, and then you have component B, which could be RNA, and that can interact with each other as well as uh, undergo phase transition. But what is more important here is to understand how when you have protein A and RNA, which is B, interact with each other when they are present together. To understand such behavior, what we have done in the last few years, we quantified the phase behavior of this system, and we found that uh, there is this process called re-entral liquid, liquid phase transition, where liquid droplets are stabilized, right, within a small window of concentrations. Um, so for example, if you fix your protein concentration and vary the RNA concentration, you have uh, two sequential phase transition. In the first transition, you form droplets, and in the second transition, you, you dissolve those droplets. Now, from the cellular perspective, such re entry transition are important to keep many aggregation from RNPs um, solvable. For example, if you look at this archetypal RNP uh, FUS, which is associated with LS because this protein undergoes aggregation, it stays uh, highly soluble in nucleus where you have high amount of RNA. And when it shuttles to cytoplasm where you have low amount of RNA, the protein undergoes phase transition readily. So this particular behavior in cell can, can be understood on the basis of a reentrant phase transition model. The cellular data that uh, sort of validated our model 
came from this beautiful paper from Simone Albertus group. All right, so apart from understanding how formation or dissolution occurs when we change the composition, I think we need to understand even if we are changing the composition within the two-phase regime, right, within these uh, shaded region, as you can see, the purple arrow, right? Suppose I'm changing my ratio of protein and RNA, whether I will be changing the condensate structure. To understand that quantitatively, Ibrahim al Sharida, a graduate student in the lab, he mapped uh, the phase diagram of a model nucleoprotein and RNA. He utilized this arginine rich nucleoprotein called protamine, and he utilized poly-U as a model RNA. When he maps the two phase regime, he clearly sees um, different structures other than droplets. For example, if you zoom into this particular region I labeled as one, you'll see well dispersed droplets. But if you zoom into uh, this particular composition, which is level S2, you'll see micellar condensates. What I mean by that are condensates which sort of form a dispersed colloid-like phase, which do not undergo fusion, not because they're gel-like, but because they have very low surface tension. And finally, what happens when you increase the composition uh, a little bit more disproportionately and, and reach this point, uh, which is level S3, you see a structural transition, these droplets uh, form these vesicle-like condensates. We have done some studies to characterize them, um, and you know, all these data are published. We see that these hollow condensates are indeed vesicle-like, which you see for classical lipid-bound structures. Uh, the protein and RNA are localized on the rim of these condensates, um, and using fluorescent correlation spectroscopy, we study the macromolecular diffusion inside and outside these vesicles. And we see that indeed uh, in the lumen, which is the interior of the vesicle has macromolecular diffusion similar to the dispersed dilute phase, while macromolecular diffusion on the rim, right, which is a condensed phase is almost three orders of magnitude slower, suggesting that you have this cold shell structure where the interior is a dilute phase. What was really interesting is to see that, uh, you know, although our building blocks are polyarginine rich motif and poly RNA, which are highly isotropic chains, they can come together and form these membrane-like structures, right? Which has a partial ordering. So what you are looking at here is this polarization micrograph, which shows this Maltese quartered pattern, very uh, typical for liquid crystalline uh, materials such as some of the liquid vesicles. Functionally, we could utilize these membranes which are uh, formed by protein and RNA, right? Um, to, to create and, and encapsulate biomolecules such as single stranded DNA and RNA in a sequence-specific manner. So if you throw uh, some green fluorescent protein, it doesn't go in, but in some cases of this uh, single stranded DNA and double stranded DNA, we can really encapsulate them within these uh, vesicles, suggesting that functionally we can achieve similar behavior as we have seen uh, for many, many years for liquid vesicles. So next question is how do they form? Of course, uh, we looked at the literature and one particular work from Boris Globsky's group uh, gave us really a lot of hint uh, in this particular work, uh, Boris Klopsky talked about um, how oppositely charged polyelectrolyte chains can come together when they are disproportionately mixed. For example, if you have high amount of peptide and low amount of RNA or vice versa. In such cases, Klopsky utilized uh, statistical physics to predict that there could be tadpole-like structure which are basically partially condensed chain. As soon as you have tadpoles due to differential solvation, they can come together, condense, and create structures such as micelles and vesicles. That's what we thought. To prove that this is really the case, we teamed up with our collaborators at Iowa State University. They utilized a molecular dynamic simulation utilizing our protein, uh, protamine, and poly RNA. And they embedded uh, these uh, electrostatic interactions between the chains. And at low chain concentration, we can clearly see formation of. Uh, that polar structure where you have this partially condensed head and a naked or bare RNA as the tail. If you increase the concentration of the tadpoles, they form micellar condensates. Now these micellar condensates are interesting because the condensate surface is coated with excess RNA, which lowers its uh, surface tension. And uh, you know that leads to stability of a colloid like cluster phase. And finally, if you push them too hard um, in terms of concentration, you can see vesicle formation, similarly what we have seen in our experiment. So what we have learned here in this particular uh, set of experimental simulation, um, that indeed spatial organization of condensate is far from understood. 
including like, you know, even if you take simple isotropic building blocks, as we have done here, we can create structures which were not predicted before, right? Dead pole structure, micelles and vesicles. And these vesicles are interesting because they sort of create membrane-like architecture without the need of any lipids. All right, so this study were recently published. Um, now I'm gonna switch gears and, and talk to you about in my next part of the talk, how uh, or what are the properties of this liquid condensation uh, we have. And two particular uh, parameters that we'd like to know or properties that we'd like to know are viscosity and surface tension, very fundamental properties of any fluid. Now, why we're interested in this is because um, as uh, one of the prevalent view in the field is, uh, you, you, you see that the monomotic protein or RNA or polymer chains, they come together, they undergo phase transition and they are liquid within this window, optimal window of, of uh, interactions. And there, if there is too much interaction, it forms aggregates as many of us have seen or you know, had to deal with uh, in, in laboratories uh, because of protein aggregation problems, right? When we purify uh, recombinant proteins from bacteria, for example. Now, one of the interests that we have uh, in our group is to understand the liquid properties. So when we talk about liquids and I go to the kitchen, right? You know, I'm a terrible cook, but I still go to the kitchen and I see all sorts of liquid, you know, you have ketchup, you have mustard, you have vegetable oil, and all of them have different viscosity and surface tension properties. And if you are talking about uh, compartmentalizing biochemical reaction in, in, in these droplets, I think it would be important to understand their viscosity and surface tension. And another process of interest is this aging that also uh, Evan mentioned that some of these liquid droplets undergo uh, solidification. And I would like to know how uh, liquid properties to begin with, right? When you have a liquid droplet, how the properties of that liquid is important and, and determines the fate of those condensates. All right, so for the talk uh, today, you know, I'm just gonna focus on one specific part, which is uh, the protein and RNA sequences and how such sequence and coded interaction control the condensate viscosity and surface tension. Okay, so our initial efforts uh, a couple of years ago uh, to start these um, measurements, our initial efforts were dedicated to uh, study how first micron scale fluid dynamics is regulated by uh, protein and RNA sequences. So what we have done here, we utilized a dual trap optical tweezer to trap these uh, droplets. And then uh, we forced them to undergo fusion in a very controlled environment. And we understand from their forced relaxation behavior how uh, viscosity and surface tensions are. So let me show you how these experiments are done. So you have these uh, two optical traps which are invisible here. You have a flow cell, you flow these droplets, they undergo fusion and, and they grow. And then what you can do is you can study their uh, fusion behavior or force relaxation behavior as a function of their size, which is supposed to be a linear behavior giving you the ratio of viscosity or surface tension. At the same time, you can do this decade-old um, you know, technique, uh, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching that gives you some idea about nanoscale diffusion of the protein and RNA molecules within these condensates, giving you the multi-scale view uh, of all these condensates. So what we have done in the past year or so, we looked at some of the synthetic condensates where we could control, based on the literature report, we could control the protein RNA interactions. And so here, what we have done we have taken a polypeptide, which has this architecture, RG, RGG, and five repeats of that. And then we replaced those arginines with lysines. And we also have taken two different RNAs. One is uh, polyadenine, and one is, uh, the other one is polyuracil. Now, the understanding was uh, lysine is actually weaker uh, when it interacts with RNA bases because it does not have the pi electron that arginines have, right? So cadron pi and pi pi interaction is sort of uh, more dominant for arginine than lysine. And for adenine, since it has two pi membered ring compared to uracil, which has only one, so adenine would be much better pi system to interact for arginine. So in this particular combination, we already see there are, uh, there are four uh, different pairs with predicted control over interactions. And when we study how these condensates undergo infusion, right? we see uh, that there is a molecular imprint of this interaction in the microscale. For example, when we form condensers of arginine with poly A, they undergo fusion in 350 millisecond time scale. But our license is a little bit faster, it's about 200 milliseconds. When we change the RNA to poly U, we see that now arginine condensates uh, are undergoing fusion at 60 milliseconds, so way faster. 
license a 2.8 millisecond time scale, fastest uh, that, could, that, that you could see under these conditions. And between uh, these two sets, you see uh, condensate uh, fusion time scale changes almost two orders of magnitude, suggesting that molecular interaction indeed control the uh, microscale dynamics in some ways. We also have done uh, fluorescence recovery after photobleaching measurement, and you see the same rank order. Uh, as you see that the lysine with poly U droplets is the fastest to recover, and arginine with poly A is the slowest. Here we are measuring the polypeptide diffusivity. One of the important aspects here is to see this um, arginine uh, or RG-RGG polypeptide within these RG poly A droplets, they do not recover at all, suggesting that the diffusion is arrested. So if you just take a look at these FRAP data, you might think, oh, these are arrested structure, which is not completely true because the droplet undergo fusion in 350 millisecond time scale, so suggesting there are length scale dependent structures, um, sorry, length scale dependent dynamics uh, where you see decoupling of nanoscale motion from microscale, all right? So after this initial characterization, we wanted to do something more. We wanted to really characterize these fluid properties. So what we have done, Using this relaxation measurement as a function of diameter, where the slope gives you the viscosity of a surface tension, we coupled it with angular measurement, which is very conventional in, in soft matter physics, where you, you track particles or beams into these condensates and uh, look at this trajectory of downward motion, and then calculate its uh, mean as far displacement to get a sense of uh, diffusion coefficient of viscosity. Now, in this specific uh, schematic, I'm showing only one bead, but indeed, these droplets have multiple different beads that are undergoing Brownian motion in our experiments. Once you have the viscosity, what you can do is you can now um, go back to your force relaxation curve and, and uh, calculate the surface tension. Uh, Isabel and I first uh, did this experiment as a function of uh, the composition of the mixture, as I mentioned about reentrant condensation, where you are changing the mixture composition, you are forming different structure. But even if you are forming droplets, we could actually see using our technique that the viscosity and surface tension undergoes a non-monotonic change, which is really significant if you think about your values of viscosity, which is undergoing almost four-fold of change, and then surface tension is also uh, in a similar um, scale. And just by changing ratio, we can actually control the viscosity and surface tension, which is consistent for a reentrant phase transition model because there are two critical points at low RNA and at high RNA. So that's why you see a non monotonic behavior. We wanted to do more. We, we wanted to understand really how sequence and protein interaction control these properties, right? So, first, what we did, we looked at um, the RGRGG motif in human RNA triangle protein. So more than 50% of uh, human RNPs have these uh, you know, RGRGG motifs that bind to RNA not specifically. And when we looked at these sequences, we see that there are these aromatic residues uh, apart from arginine and glycine, and there is also this proline. So I'm not gonna talk to you about all these different sequences. So this, uh, the, the radius of these spheres are equivalent to their relative abundance in the proteins. Now, first we did our lysine and arginine uh, condensates, uh, although lysine is not at all present in this repeat. And we see that as predicted based on our multi-scale analysis before, we see arginine condensates are much more viscous than lysine condensates, as well as their surface tension is many fold higher. What is interesting that when we change some of this arginine with tyrosine, right, we decrease um, our arginine content by 50%. Um, so we have now RGYGG repeats, and we immediately see that our uh, condensates have uh, viscosity is many fold higher. So for RGRGG, our viscosity was about uh, 10 pascal second. Now we have about 70 or 80 pascal second. Just to keep things into perspective, uh, 10 pascal, per se pascal second is honey, and 70 or 50, above 50 is uh, ketchup, right? So you see different types of viscoelastic behavior for these condensates. All right, so this is consistent with how a multimodal interaction might strengthen the network within these droplets. Next, uh, we looked at uh, phenylalanine and proline when we substitute um, our, our, our RGYGC sequence and we, we substitute these uh, tyrosines with phenylalanine, we see a drop of viscosity almost uh, to one half. And then uh, and this is your RGRGG sequence and you replace this uh, 50% of these arginines with proline, and you see a dramatic reduction in viscosity, right? Now these droplets are even 
uh, less in viscosity compared to kg kgt droplet, which is incredible, suggesting there is a great deal of variation one can do by changing just the sequence features. However, we just started scratching the surface, right? Because we just uh, looked at some repeat polypeptide sequences, which are bioinformatically, uh, you know, we analyzed from human protein, but there are sequence specific interaction, there could be patterning and length variation, there could be folded RNA recognition motif and RNA structure, of course. So far, we are looking at just uh, non specific uh, unfolded RNA structures. And all these gonna change how uh, this viscoelastic or viscous sort of surface tension. Um, viscosity and surface tension are, are regulated. And finally, we'd like to understand what it means in terms of uh, the uh, functional outcome of these condensates. For example, if this is really a reaction crucible, we would like to know how changing viscosity and surface tension quantitatively impact the fate of the reaction within these condensates. With that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our team members, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Mahadi and, and uh, Richu. Uh, two uh, postdocs and Ibrahim and Torun played uh, two graduate students uh, helped me incredibly in the last few years to set up the lab and get all these uh, interesting studies going and our collaborators uh, and, and our funding agencies for generous support. And thank you all for joining and, and I'd be happy to answer any question right now or later via email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Priya. This was an interesting, very interesting talk. I think, David, we have some questions. We only have uh, three minutes, but uh, David, if you can go yes. to the questions. So we have a question from the attendees from Miranda Lynch. Uh, Priya, in the FRAP fusion assay, what are the components of each drop being fused? Are they identical in each drop or heterogeneous in terms of either identity or proportion of components? Would non-identical drops fuse differently? So uh, they are all identical. So uh, we have not tried uh, to mix uh, you know, non-identical drops. So in the first set of studies, we lo looked at RG, RGG5 polypeptide with poly A or poly U RNA. And then uh, you know, we did the same set of studies with KG, KGG5 droplets um, with um, you know, a poly U or poly A RNA. And we have not tried uh, to fuse say a RG5 droplet with KG5, um, you know, but they actually mix. So that will be an interesting thing to try. For fusion, uh, sorry, for FRAP assay, we're looking at uh, polypeptide diffusion, uh, such as RG and KG in different droplets. Okay, we have um, another question. I think this was for the previous uh, speaker, uh, but I'll, I'll, uh, the question is, are there physiological condensates made by two protein components, one positive and one negatively charged? I think maybe that's a general question for the uh, session. Yes, uh, so I'll probably take the opportunity to answer it, yes. Uh, so there are many cases where you have a negatively charged uh, protein where you have this polyglutamic acid tract. NPM1 is a nuclear protein which has such kind of uh, you know, negatively charged tract and there could be rgg rich motifs, um, uh, such as uh, nucleoline has this long arginine rich uh, positively charged tract and those two can come together and, and undergo phase transition due to electrostatic interactions. Maybe I'll ask one quick question. I really enjoyed your seed trap experiments with the optical tweezers. I was wondering, you know, one, one concern in those experiments is that the trapping laser changes the temperature of the system, which is very important uh, yeah. for vesicles. So, so can you comment on that? Yes, uh, fantastic question. We, we indeed can you know, induce phase separation by changing the trapping laser power. So we carefully calibrate the temperature and, and the experimental data that I showed. Uh, the, Temperature fluctuation is within 0.5 degrees centigrade or so because of their very, very low trapping power. But uh, it is very uh, you know, uh, important to calibrate your temperature using temperature sensitive dyes to make sure that the power is in a range where it does not cause too much change of your, uh, of your um, you know, condensate uh, temperature. Otherwise you will have local effect and you can actually see it uh, by changing the laser power. You can induce phase separation for thermoresponsive polymers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Priya. 